Hey, brand builder, Rory Vaden here. Thank you so much for taking the time to check out this interview. As always, it's our honor to provide it to you for free and wanted to let you know there's no big sales pitch or anything coming uh, at the end. However, if you are someone who is looking to build and monetize your personal brand, we would love to talk to you and get to know you a little bit and hear about some of your dreams and visions and share with you a little bit about what we're up to to see if we might be a fit. So if you're interested in a free strategy call with someone from our team, we would love to hear from you. You can do that at brandbuildersgroup.com slash podcall, brandbuildersgroup.com slash podcall. We hope to talk to you soon. You know, as humbly as I can say, sometimes when I think about this podcast, I go, it's insane the quality of the guests that you hear and get access to for free and the quality of guests that I get access to for free. And today is definitely an example of that. You are about to meet, if you don't already know, one of the smartest people in business, in personal development. That's how I would describe Todd Herman. We've known each other for years uh, at a distance, we've we kind of gotten closer over the last few years. And just every time I turn around, somebody's talking about how brilliant this guy is and how sharp and how awesome he is. So he's a Wall Street Journal bestselling author of a book called The Alter Ego Effect, um, The Power of Secret Identities to Transform Your Life, which came out years ago, but has been you know one of these perennial bestsellers. Um, he's an international speaker. He's a peak performance coach. Uh, he has been the recipient of Inc.'s 500 Fastest Growing Companies Award. He speaks for groups like YPO, like some of the most prolific groups uh, around. Of course, he's been featured in CBS and Business Insider, a lot of the like you know major media kind of empires. But one of the things that Todd has done that is super unique, which is what I am particularly interested in, not because we're trying to do this, but because we kind of did this once and very few people do it is scaling a training coaching consulting business and selling it um he has done this three different times in three different ways with sort of three different group like three different kind of models which is what we're going to talk about because i think that this is the future i think that personal brands eventually wake up to the idea to go yeah i want to be well known i want to have influence i want to have reach but dang it, if I'm going to work as hard as normal entrepreneurs, I also want to have something that has enterprise value and asset value. So anyways, I kind of just begged Todd to say, dude, will you come on the show and just like share your wisdom? And it took me a long time to coordinate schedules, but he's here. It's great to have you, bro. Dude, I'm excited. Um, yeah, just to dig into this stuff, because I know your audience and uh, the topic around you know, building a coaching business that could be somewhat sellable for someone is such a foreign concept for many people. Not that everyone has to sell something, but I've been in this space for 26 years. I'm going into my 26th year. I started in 1997 before mm. coaching was a thing. So i um, happy to uh, open up the uh, kimono, so, so to speak, and just drop as much as I can to help out. Yeah, well, I'd love to hear it. And I do want to get into, I want to talk a little bit about alter ego because I know that ties in. I mean, that ties into yeah. it. Um, but just to so give us the history of scaling and selling a company. And and I want to hear just kind of like, okay, you have these sort of three different generations or iterations that you've done. Yeah. And, you know, I think like uh, I was mentored by Zig Ziglar and I knew him personally. And I was I was friends with him when he fell and he hit his head and he started to lose his short term memory. And it was interesting to see how that affected the business. Right. And he yeah. couldn't speak anymore. And um, of course, Dave Ramsey is here in Nashville and he's been thinking about ye for years about succession planning and scaling the business beyond him and creating the personalities. And I think this is as personal brands wake up to the idea of going, man, how do I build something that outlasts me, that runs without me? I'm not uh, the just the dancing bear on stage all the time. Yeah, and you, you've you've done that, man. So tell us tell us three quick stories about what they were. Yeah, so the the very first one was the peak athlete, which is what I started in '97, and I was uh, you know very young at the time. I was 21 when I started doing mental game coaching, peak performance stuff for uh, athletes, and I. Uh, as I was growing that business, I did it on the back of really only one channel. 
Um, so there's different types of channels we can all use to market with, right? And so the only thing I knew how to do, I was not a marketer by any stretch of imagination, but I grew up in the world of 4-H. I grew up on a big ranch and farm yeah. in uh, Canada. And, and you know, in the world of 4-H, it's like agricultural Boy Scouts for people who don't know. And you always had to do a speech every single year in your club. And if you won that one, then you'd go to the next level and next level, next level. So I started when I was 10 and I just fell in love with speaking. I was very natural at it. And that was what I used to grow uh, the peak athlete was I offered uh, free speeches in a context of 90 days. And I ended up doing 68 free speeches in my province of Alberta, where I was living at the time. And people go, 68 speeches in 90 days, how did that happen? And um, I mean, that's a completely different story, but that's what kind of got me my waiting list of clients. Okay. Got it. Um, Love it. And so, but I was trading nothing but time for dollar. Um, I was super busy. I would charge $75 for a package of three sessions. That's what my price point was. When I did my quick in taxes in 97, 98, 99, I was making $8 and 56 cents an hour. Nice. Gas money. Um, was my biggest cost was traveling around all these young kids after school to, to see them. But I'm a big so you believer were selling in to kids, you were doing speeches. And then at the end of the speech, you were basically saying, Hey, if you like this, join my, yeah. my $75 package yeah. coaching program. Yeah. Um, yep. how I gave up my free speech was I said, I'll do my talk for free. Normally it's $2,200, but if you get all one parent from each of the kids in the room, I'll do it for free because they're the wallet holder, right? That was the, that was the worst part about that business was this person's getting the service, but this other person's paying for it. Right. Um, but as a parent, we'll do anything for our kids. Right. So, um, that was the, that was what I did. So the, offers where either work with a kid one-on-one -on -one or come in and work with a team. And okay. uh, so I was just learning as I was going, there was no internet back then for me to be Googling how to run a coaching business because that wasn't even an industry at the time. And so this um, is awesome. I love this so much, but I was super, but I was, you know, even though I wasn't making much money, I was busy and I was working a lot and I loved what I was doing. So I was getting a lot of reps, which is probably the thing that's most overlooked in, I think our world today, people yeah. are trying to race towards expertise status before they ever even have any sort of practitionership or, you know, sinew on the muscle or on the bone. And, you know, I've, I've passed well over 19,000 hours of one-on-one -on -one coaching with elite athletes. So long story short was, was doing quite well, but I didn't, I just, knew I didn't know enough. So I sought out a mentor named Harvey Dorfman. And he's known as the Yoda of baseball, greatest mental game coach to ever live. Uh, cold called them, asked if I could come and spend some time with him in North Carolina during the baseball off season. And uh, he called me back and he said, you're not going to live with me, kid, are you? And I said, no, I have got an aunt and uncle who live near you in North Carolina, which was a lie. Um, that wasn't true at all. <laughs> I ended up staying at a Motel 6 for $28 a night on my, my Scotiabank Visa card, which I maxed out when I was down there with a $1,000 limit. But um, I got to go spend 33 days with Harvey. And during that time, Roger Clemens came in to see him, Andy Pettit, Craig Biggio, like the biggest names in baseball. And I got to see the best guy work with the best athletes. And I was like, oh my goodness, all the stuff I thought you would talk about with a pro athlete, because I wasn't working with pros yet was completely wrong. And then he started funneling me clients. And he also talked to me about like, hey, like developing intellectual property. I'd never heard of that before. So, you know, how this then ties into all these other ones is if you want to grow and scale and ultimately sell a business, what people don't understand about this world is one of the first questions any company is going to ask you is how many trademarks do you own? Mm. Okay. My company now, like the one that I, the one existing, I own 44 trademarks. Wow. Each one of those trademarks has a dollar value on it. So everyone thinks it's all about, well, how much revenue are you doing in your company? No. A buying company wants to know how well is your stuff protected in the, because this, this is what we're selling is intellectual property. Whether it's your coaching process, whether it's the method that you have, whether it's the brand framework that you use. Um, and so I fell down that rabbit hole of learning about intellectual property. I went to Steve Jobs' as mentor. Um, David Sibbett is his name. He wrote the book, um, Visual Meetings, Visual Teams, Visual Leaders. Um, Steve Jobs only mentor mentioned him once, and that was at a speech that I happened to be at at University of Washington. 
So I went and learned how to draw models and create models and frameworks and whatnot. So um, ultimately, the peak athlete ended up selling um, two decades later, almost to Real Madrid um, in so 2014. So did you have other like coaches or was it just the methodology and the IP that you sold? I, I rare, there was, um, I never scaled through other coaches. I scaled through intellectual property and licensing. Um, so the peak athlete, I built out a amazing training system for developing the, um, inner, um, inner game of athletes. And then I licensed it to the German soccer federation, the Danish Olympic team, the South African spring box, um, sports teams around the world. And I actually just went to a South African Springboks rugby game in Sydney, Australia, like a month ago. <laughs> oh, that's how lucky are you? That would have been a great game. Because it was awesome. Rivals. It yeah. was awesome. So you, yeah. you, you licensed this methodology to these teams. Yeah. So you just cold called these teams and then said, Hey, I've got a process for training your athletes and it'll cost you this much per year or whatever. Well, I mean, this goes back to the benefit of speaking a lot. So I would, because I was speaking so much, all the leads were basically coming in at the end of those talks. And then I had built up such a good name that at the highest level of really any industry, most decisions are made by, you know, hey, Rory, do you know anyone that is X, Y, good at X, Y, and Z? Yeah. And if you can keep your name top of mind, which is which is branding or personal branding, um, it's a com it's a very unfair advantage that you have. So I never had to do as much cold calling. I did do direct outreach, but that really wasn't my game. My game was getting on stages and around the world uh, talking about what I talked about and which was building the triune athlete, the mentally, emotionally, and physically tough athlete. And, um, and then giving people processes and then you know, I would mention in my stories and case studies that, you know, the German Soccer Federation since 2004 has been, you know, licensing our training and, and their development of their athletes and, and on and on and on. So, yeah. So you then, weren't cold calling them. You were working through relationships, but they were they were a client of yours. So they were paying to access yeah. your system. Yeah. yeah. And then you would deliver exactly. it to them. Like I would do a present. train the trainer series. I would do a train uh, the trainer series with all their people. Um, one, showing them how to train on it. And then second, showing them how to coach on it. And that was the secret was because there was a lot of stuff out there that's training in nature. The problem is if your stuff is only at the level of training someone or educating, that doesn't necessarily mean it's becoming an embedded part of the ethos or the philosophy of an organization. But when people are now taking the training and implementing it through coaching, that's a very different, um, you know, essentially metastasized tumor that goes on inside of that company. So, you know, German Soccer Federation renewed that license for well over a decade with me. Um, so I did the work once and then every year I would do an update with them typically a two hour call with their head of training and a few other people. And, um, and that was basically it. Interesting. So they're just, so you're training the trainers and then you're licensing the IP for them to go and administer it. How yeah. do you define the difference between training and coaching? Well, uh, training is, uh, typically one to many people at the front of a room where you're introducing, whether it's new concepts, new methods, you're, you're teaching something, you're training someone on how to, especially with our world of like intellectual property and think like, I'm not showing you how to swing a baseball bat necessarily. Cause you can train someone on that and you can, that's where training and coaching kind of gets a little bit mixed up at the same time. But in our world, th there are two very different disciplines. Training is giving them the processes, the systems. Coaching is ensuring that it's being put into action. And coaching is really about three things. There's really, coaching is only three things. Encouragement, accountability, and progress. Those are the three legs of the stool that support a coach. If you're someone who doesn't know how to encourage or can't hold people accountable or can't model back to people the progress that they're making, 
those you, you would grade yourself very low on being a good coach. And so then who did you sell this to? Because you're already you're already printing money, right? If you're licensing it, it's just like these yeah. people are using it and that person is using it. So like, who did you sell it? How did you identify the buyer? How do you value that kind of a thing? And then mm -hmm. what happened to your existing customers? Yeah. So first, who'd you sell to? It was uh, two ways you came in. Relationships with coaches would be the most common way to, for me to come in. So uh, could be the, uh, the, the GM or coach of, say, the German national soccer team. Okay. And I develop a relationship with him because I have a relationship already with the head coach of the Cleveland Browns. Like people don't realize in sport just how much people from other industries now share and talk. Hmm. And I got to live through that cycle in the 80s and 90s, not necessarily so, but 2000s, very collaborative culture. And so uh, in through the coach or in through uh, training directors, um, you would be looking for, let's say, the uh, director of training for the Danish Olympic team, okay? They're the people who are tasked with how can we improve and develop our athletes? And they're out there constantly doing research, trying to find out what's new in physiology, behavioral sciences, neurosciences, and, and whatnot. And that's those would be the two main people that I'd be coming in through was there. In professional sports uh, like the NHL, uh, I did a direct mail campaign and it was, I sent out the direct mail campaign to the uh, GMs of the teams and to the head coaches. So every team would get two letters, one to the GM and one to the head coach of the team. Yeah. So when I meant sell, so that's awesome. That's, that's helpful. It's just like, you know, if there's somebody in charge of buying the thing and you figure out who they are and you work through yeah. re referrals and presentations and direct yeah. mail, I meant when you sold the company, did you, you actually sold that company? Oh, sorry. Yeah. So what happened was Real Madrid has now become the uh, the diamond on top of the sports mountain. Uh, there are sports teams from around the world who go to Real Madrid University. They have a university now and make a pilgrimage to go and learn about how Real Madrid develops their athletes because they've been so far ahead of everybody else. Like North American sport has been an archaic mountain for a long time with the way that they've approached sport and Real Madrid has been way on the forefront of um, uh, diagnostic type stuff, you know, getting people to wear uh, biofeedbacks um, type devices. And so I was a part of a team that came in to develop Real Madrid's peak performance system. And so like working with like Cristiano Ronaldo and, and those guys, but that's who ultimately wanted to buy it and own, own the IP that I had. Okay. So, so they the just... deal, the deal that I struck with them was they can buy it. And then, um, and, and they didn't care about any of the revenue that came, they just wanted to own it. And, and so, um, all those other basically contracts that I had, um, it was a two year out. They could, so the German soccer federation could continue to use it for two more years. Um, I got to, con I got to keep it for my own personal use though, as well. Uh, so when you sold it, you basically maintained like your own global license to use it and train it however you wanted. No, not global license. I could use it for one-on-one -on -one clientele because oh. I had built up such a big name in sport. Like, you know, when Kobe Bryant is one of your clients and you helped him build out the Black Mamba, you know, and, and your, my entire world was built around referability. So the only way that you could get to me to work with me one-on-one -on -one was you had to be referred by a uh, present client or past client. And, um, so I could use it for one-on-one -on -one stuff. That was, that was okay. the only thing I really cared about. Yeah. I got and then it. that, so, yeah. And did they approach, just, so did they approach you about it, I guess, or did you approach them? Like they said, no, hey, cause I was already working. Yeah. I was already working with them. The relationship is so strong. Um, they see its impact, you know, and like, when you think about the frustrations that all of us can have around wanting to achieve any sort of goal or mark of excellence in some sort of discipline, whether it's marketing or whatever. And we've all been handed bits and pieces to things. When someone comes along and they actually have a well-defined, complete and codified system of dealing with a whole athlete, which then also permeates at the team level, it's so refreshing. And when you think about from now that program director side of things or the head coach or the GM, they're like, this allows me to not have to go out and acquire 
10 other people to do this. I got one stop. Like it was a full meal deal type thing. And that was always my goal was to like continuously develop it. I was the first, like it, back when I started sports psychology was the term that was used. And we were the first company to hire three neuroscientists to come onto our team. We we're the first ones to dive into the actual science, because when people actually know anything about psychology or psychiatry, out of all the scientific disciplines, it's the least sciencey. It's the most theoretical. Um, and we were the first ones to start really diving into the science of it. And some of that's just because I come from a farm and ranch. You know, my dad has phrases like, well, that dog won't hunt, which is basically a, you know, a bullshitometer. Um, yeah. And I found a ton of it in, and I still find a ton of it in the self-help, personal development, you know, all that kind of world space. People are still spouting off stuff that was written 70 years ago that is categorically categorically proven to either be false or very um, ineffective. There are way smarter ways to go about achieving uh, some level of mastery or success than what. So did you typically... have a lot of employees when you sold this or was it really just like, it was the IP, it was basically a IP and some trademarks and that was- I kept it you... super lean. Uh, all Definitely. the way. So um, at my at my max for the peak athlete, we had seven team members. Yeah, seven. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. So then, so then, tell us about the next ones. This is fascinating. So the next one. So that's really like an IP business. You're basically selling your yeah. methodology to someone who just says, "We love it. We believe in it. We want it. We want to own it." Done. Yeah. Um, so, so this ties into again your personal brand world. So. Um, here I am speaking on stages. A lot of times the people in your audience are not target markets for you, but they like the topic that you have. So here I am talking to athletes and sports teams. And invariably, once you start rising through the ranks of sport, a lot of times the only people who can afford to keep their athlete in more elite levels is people that have got some money in their pocket. And one of the things that started happening was I'd get people coming to me afterwards and say, listen, I loved what you just said about, um, you know, the triune athlete or developing mental toughness or inner game stuff or emotional resiliency. And, you know, but I was thinking the entire time, these are all the same issues I've got on my team in my business or my mm -hmm. team or department in the government. And so people would say like, could you do the same thing for um, my company? And for the first couple of times I'd say, no, you know, I don't really know. And that was maybe maybe the immaturity of my entrepreneurship. A great entrepreneur would have would have went, yeah, absolutely. And so I said this to one of my mentors. You talked about Zig Ziglar. Jim Rohn was one of my mentors. He was actually oh, my first cool. one. I met him when I was cool. 21. And I actually know some funny stories about Jim and Zig behind the scenes too. But um, uh, Zig always got very frustrated with the fact that Jim was terrible at returning phone calls. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so... I had said this to a mentor and he was like, here's your answer from now on. Absolutely. And then again, they just educated me about your, your intellectual property probably isn't going to change that much. So what I then started was a company called No Limits Coaching and Consulting, which was geared towards performance and leadership uh, training and coaching for the corporate and government world. Okay. okay. And, um, I used again, just speaking to kind of build that up. It was almost like a little side hustle thing. I think for me to say yes to ultimately though, that one ended up becoming bigger than the sports one because corporate can spend way more money. And, um, it's actually what forced me to do licensing because I wasn't able to devote as much time anymore to, to, uh, the peak athlete as much. So it's a great example of how constraints are actually great powers of invention for you. Because with that, I ended up, because the peak athlete one I ended up selling, it was the world's largest mental game coaching and peak performance company um, in revenue and in number of people that we served because we did well over 2 million athletes in total coming through our training programs uh, back then. So no limits. Uh, my first client was actually the Canadian government. Uh, they were, because that was Rick came up to me at the end of one of my small little talks of 30 kids and asked me. And so I just simply took the IP and this is a good example of taking it into just a new market. The product never changed that much, you know, change out some lipstick and some eyeshadow on it, right? 20% of it, just to make sure it's customized to that audience. But 
human performance is human performance. It doesn't matter if it's really on the field over here or on the court and or whether it's in the boardroom or sitting at your desk. Performance is performance is performance. And um, that's that's how I started to grow that business. But and you had then, sold the you had sort you had sort of sold this IP. So like the certain visuals and labels and all those things you just had to like you have to change that. But the principles are the same, and the print you can't you can't just like well, nobody owns principles. Yeah, no one owns principles. But the moment you put something into a shape, you can trademark it. So circles, triangles, and squares are your best friend in um, in our world. So if if you have steps. If you have processes, you can't trademark those, but you can trademark things like, so I've got one, people can go to it and it's, it's a good learning lesson. So my, my um, entrepreneurial performance training company, 90 day year. So if you go to 90 year.com and there's one called the five stages of business, that hierarchy model, it's like uh, almost like Maslow's hierarchy needs my five stages of business. That is a trademark piece of IP that um, cannot be, replicated, reproduced um, without the express written consent of me and my company. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm a very big protector of IP. I'm actually well known for it in, in kind of our world. Like you, you don't, you don't touch my stuff. So let's talk about that. Okay. So, okay. So these are the three companies. So you have the sports company, then you have the leadership company. Who'd yeah. you sell the leadership company to? Chevron. What? Yeah. So I did a speech in San Antonio, Texas. It was a leadership event. And um, just so happened that uh, this guy, Ken, uh, was who was the executive VP at Chevron, came up to me and they were dealing with a major issue with developing a workforce that was a big divide between the seniors and the juniors. Because in the 1980s, there was no uh, investment in the oil and gas space. So they had something called the big crew change, which was all these people who were senior are going to be leaving with all of the intellectual property of how to run a, you know, oil and gas or energy company. And they had no one to backfill with. And they've been trying to fix it for a decade, but no one was coming together. And he came to me and said, I think you're the guy who can do this. And I was like, I've never been in your space. I mean, I grew up on a farm and ranch and I know the gas world about as much as anyone driving by a, a pumping rig. And, uh, I said no at first, and then he convinced me with maybe a little bit more money. And um, I also realized I was the opportunity was going to be incredible because I was going to be sitting down with the CEOs and presidents and uh, sometimes even leaders of countries around the world getting this big project done. And uh, ultimately, they ended up buying that uh, leadership and performance training um, system that I had. So was it very similar? They're basically buying a set of frameworks and and visuals and Yep. methods and phrases and charts and, and tables and a, and, a, and a train the trainer system that could be easily deployed towards remote you know areas around the world exactly yeah so 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 the train the trainer thing is interesting so basically you have to it's almost like you have two things to build you have to build the thing and then you have to build the thing that trains people to teach the thing exactly yeah so you've got and the easiest way to think about it is here's how you would do it is um, if you train it, then record yourself going through why you trained it the way that you trained it. And then I would take that and then I would take that transcript and then I would just go make my edits into it. And when you start to like learn more about facilitation skills, how to be a great facilitator, the first thing that I learned in my, my own growth as a you know person in this space in my own career was how unimportant sometimes the content was mm. Meaning we all try to overwhelm people with lots of content and what's more important is getting people traction and momentum um, because most people's experience of almost all courses and training programs is they never did implement anything but if you're the one who even got them from point one to point two or you know a to b let alone Z, because we're all thinking about, I want to get you to Z, but that's you imparting your own desires and motivations onto the one learner. And all some people want is just a, a micro improvement even. Um, so anyways, that's just, you know, when you learn good facilitation skills, you learn that, you know, not to overwhelm people with content. Context is, is very important.
So your buyer came up, your buyer in that scenario came out very similarly. They were someone that saw you in a speech. They became a fan. You develop a relationship. They, yeah. you, they become a customer. Basically, as a customer, they go, man, we like it. We believe in it. We want it. We don't want anyone else to have this. Here's a check and we'll take that from you. That's right. Yeah. I love that. I freaking love that. So then, yeah. so then the third one is an entrepreneurial coaching company. Well, that's my, that's my current one. The that's third one current. was uh, another one that happened in about a six month time span after I had sold the leadership company. Um, I still had a bunch of intellectual property that was left over and um, I was kind of just looking for my next um, thing to do while they, I was still. They coaching. didn't want, like they didn't, they didn't want to. They acquire. didn't need it. It didn't serve their needs. Yeah. It didn't serve okay. their, you know, the market of who they had. So then I went and sold that last little bit to which which now getting to your point of trying to find a buyer this was me going out and finding a buyer and i what, what i did was i pinged about i think it was probably 18 different friends in the industry and said hey i have this uh um piece of like training material it would most likely be best for this industry, this type of you know client customer. Do any of you know anyone who would be interested in in purchasing it? And um, a friend reached out right away from the self defense market, and and said uh, this stuff would be outstanding in um, for a friend of mine. And then they made the connection, and and that was uh, how it sold. And, and Rory, this is actually a real, this is something I talk about a lot to all of our mentoring clients as well. The hardest part about this business model, everyone says it's so easy and and they're wrong. It's not, coaching is not as easy as everyone says it is. <laughs> no, coaching everyone says is it's so easy because it doesn't difficult. take any inventory. You don't have to buy something and it's got to be on a ship that comes over and sits in a warehouse somewhere. So it's taking up cash flow or, you know, something like that. But you know, building any business where you're building the product and the marketing at the same time is very, very challenging. And so one of the things that I had done early on was I learned about licensing. And so that's what I did was I went out and bought up and I licensed other people's training from them to make me go faster so I could go out and impact more people. Mm. So, um, you know, my worst decisions in my career have always been based on ego. You know, I needed to do it to satisfy my own ego needs. And my best decisions were all ones where I, um, I didn't try to do it on my own. I went and I, you know, whether it's licensed something or I outright just buy it from someone, their own IP. Cause you can buy information for a lot of people don't know how to value things. And well, um, I wanted to ask you about that. Like, how do you, how do you go about valuing this? Right. So, I mean, let's say somebody's listening right now and they're like, man, I've been in the mortgage industry for 30 years. I got the training manual. Da, 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 da. Like I got the whole thing. And I mean, I, the way that I think about a business is, you know, and I think the, the, yeah, my, my undergrad was accounting. Right. And so I process it from a very financial, it's like, it's a, it's a present value of a future stream of estimated cash flows. So mm -hmm. it's going, the business throws off a dollar this year. So I'm going to, I'm going to pay you $5 for your, for your business. It, it gives me a dollar and hopefully I can get my $5 back faster, but worst case scenario, I get it back in five years and then every yeah. year after, right? Like it's the net, the, the official term net present value of future, future cash flows. IP is sort of different than that it feels to me more like the way you would do a strategic valuation which is you have this piece of your machine that i think i can take and i can plug it into my machine and it'll make my machine more valuable in the way yeah. that m my machine is valued is that kind of the that's exactly topic? right yeah and so sometimes people are looking at speed okay does this thing is this thing going to make us go faster or is this thing going to make us or is this thing going to make give us a um uh, a, a competitive advantage over other people. That was Real Madrid's play with with my stuff because they were building up this university and now they didn't have to go build curriculum, hire other people to put it together, try and get people to collaborate together who have very strong opinions on things. No, it has to be this way and this way and, and, and that way. Um, that's always the challenge about bringing you know, anyone who's a subject matter expert on something together is you bring seven together in a room and you got a lot of times seven different opinions on how it should mm -hmm. be done or could be done. So you're avoiding political hassle then as well. And you get to monetize it tomorrow. 
that was that was what Real Madrid could go and do. Uh, Chevron wasn't caring about monetization. They were caring about actually the big, massive problem that they had, which was this big crew change. And um, so, so that was speed then, speed to mitigating the problem that they had. So the way that I think about IP and trademarks, this is just a rough number, but it's borne fruit for me three times. For every trademark that you own, it's a, worth about a quarter of a million dollars to your business. Your business is value. If you, the moment you add a trademark to your company, now there's some conditions to this, which I'll explain, but it's going to add $250,000 in valuation to your business. And now, if you're in the <laughs> coaching space of, let's say, goddess energy, let's just say, you know, and there's, no knock against that. There are some people who are do quite well in that space, but that's not a big market. That's a market that you actually have to create with your marketing because no one wakes up and says, I want to be a goddess today. But there's other people who wake up and they go, man, I am sick and tired of trying to fight so hard for clients. I need a stronger personal brand. Now, they might not say it exactly language that way, but personal branding is quite a large market, all right? So, you know, if, you know, Brand Builders Inc. goes out and takes a look at their IP and readjusts it and makes it more trademarkable and registers it, and you have 10 of those pieces, you just added, even if you have no clients, that's two and a half million dollars worth of valuation. And and to do this process, so each one you're saying is maybe roughly valued at two hundred fifty thousand. Yeah. How much does it cost? Because you, if you create it, you got to hire a lawyer, you got to fill out some paperwork, you got to file, do some filing, you got to wait for some approval, you have to like answer questions, go back and forth, and then one day, the, it's the, not that it's it's it sounds super hard to a lot of people. I thought it was exactly like that to Rory the first time I did it, and then I was after, actually describing that like it's pretty easy. Like it's like these are a few very simple tactical steps. I mean, is there more? Well, to the it answer, than what the I answer, the answer for me and you is. I mean, I send everyone to the same lawyer that's been doing it for me for a long, long time, and he's been he's he's literally specializes just in our space, Peter, um, uh, you know, based out of New York, and. You know, yeah, I think I, I I even forget how much it costs me anymore, but I think it's probably somewhere around twenty five hundred bucks, you know, from start to finish with the different people who are involved. Very little time on my end um, to get it done, but uh, you know, someone else can go and do all the filings themselves, and it'll cost them a few hundred bucks. Mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. but to your point about now, but coming bringing it back to the purpose of your podcast, personal branding. This also is a forcing function to get the quality of your names on your frameworks right because you start to do you know, trademark searches and you're like, oh, the name that I've been using for a long time is already a registered trademark and it happens to be in the same space as me. So that's not unique then. Um, let's, oh, what's, what's a new name possibly that I have to come up with? And what if you find out that like, what if you find out... Um... What if you find that that somebody created something after you? So like, let's say that you have created this thing, it's been in use, and now somebody else has it. If they got the trademark first, does that prevent you from basically no. getting it? No, because there's, um, uh, I, f I forget the actual technical term. Uh, it's just on the there's like a first. It's like a first in use. Yeah, exactly. It's The yeah. word is in, there's something in use. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, if it's, if you've been, if you can prove that it's been in use for a long, and it's happened with me a couple of times and, uh, we were able to prove on two different occasions that we had it in use first. Um, I actually just won, um, uh, a lawsuit against Instagram because they were not giving me an Instagram handle and profile. That's a trademark name of ours and, uh, Instagram lost and they had to hand it over to me. Take that Zuck. Yeah. Take yeah. You that. Don't, we, you don't win many of those battles. Um, <laughs> but again, that's the power of having something that's registered and, you know, all. In, wow. in your, yeah. So they have to, they have to grant you the handle because you have the registered trademark of that. Absolutely. Term. Because the, the laws of the U S trumped whatever their privacy policy in terms of use policy was on their site. Uh huh. Um, so what about, um, how do you police this? Okay. So, so let's say you've got some trademarks. 
Yeah. So this this is interesting to me because there are there are a couple things. So one is uh, I have this quote from my first book, Take the Stairs, which is came out in 2012. This quote, success is never owned, it's rented, and the rent is due every day. And that quote has been, I'm talking like J.J. Watt has used it and uh, rappers and NBA stars. And it's like, yeah, that quote is mine and my Mm -hmm. book, but it's a quote, right? So it's like, you can't really trademark a quote. So there's that. And then I have um, this other flagship story of mine, which is a Buffalo, a story about Buffalo charging into the storm. And now it's like, now it's people are retelling the story and it's going viral on social. And now they're creating mugs and posters around like this story. So it's, I struggle a little bit with going, well, part of the goal, both from an impact perspective and a branding perspective is you want people to share your stuff. Like that's part of the goal, right? Is I want them to hit the share button, but on the same side, it's like, how do you protect, you know, so talk to me about policing your trademarks and like, how do you, how do you sort, what's your, philosophy yeah there. i'll never forget when creative commons came out and then i had a few friends who jumped on it that were in that that had ip and i pinged both of them uh and i said you're opening up a can of worms here and like because you can't unsqueeze the toothpaste once you let your ip or your frameworks be open for anyone to use now again good example is actually business model generation what I think is one of the best books written in the last 30 years, or most important business books written in the last 30 years by a good friend of mine, um, Alan Smith, Alexander Osterwalder. And, you know, it's it's a it's a canvas, it's a map of business models. Okay. Well, they they opened theirs up for Creative Commons. So if you went and did a Google search for um, business model canvas or business model generation canvas, you're gonna get back. 36 million results of that image and that canvas being on different blogs and consultants' websites around the world. Well, a few years back, they wanted to try to stuff all that stuff back inside because they were now, their business model changed and they were now running a lot of workshops. Well, problem is, is there were a lot of other consultants out there running workshops off of their canvas. Um, and that's probably, if you were to factor it out, well over a hundred million dollars in, um, certifications and licensing that's lost to that business because they could have certified those people in going out and using that canvas. And now they're certified partners of the business model generation um, world. So when I say, when you get back, going back to your world or idea of um, policing it, A, I tell the story over and over and over again. It's a part of my brand story. I tell the story of you don't touch our stuff. It took, I've got 19,000 plus hours on the field of play doing one-on-one coaching. That's not counting the group and the speeches and the trainings I've done around the world, which now doubles that number, right? Um, You don't take my stuff. And it's not cease and desist that we send. We sue. And we, the minimum amount you earn in America for IP infringement is a quarter of a million dollars, okay? Now we take that money and we donate. I don't do it so I can earn money. We take that money and we take off whatever the cost was. And then we go and we donate it to one of our favorite charities. She's the first, which helps young girls in third world countries, put them through school. But all it took was a couple of those and people getting stung very hard by um, our team that we have an army of thousands of people, Rory, who ping us every week saying, Hey, I just saw someone and it looks like they're using your, your thing. And, And a lot of times, it's not that like, it's not an infringement, but we have a lot of people. We found people who were giving away some of our course material as opt-ins and downloads and lead magnets for free. Well, mm. that guy in particular, he's one of the people who this was about four years ago, five years ago now, quarter million dollars. He lost. Interesting. So then you just because because it's because it, it is actually protected by a trademark you've got the right to do that and so Absolutely. You, just, you just file a suit and they're either i guess and so they either have to settle with you or they have to st- stop using it or or no gonna... like no it's it's no they Rory it's it's so um obtuse and um you know whatever other term I can come up with right now but to think that someone isn't doing it maliciously. They're doing it maliciously. They know what they're doing. We go to the end. 
we finish it with them. There is no apology. I'm so sorry. I didn't know what I was doing. And no, there's none of that. There's none of that. That's why like for me, like attribution, it costs you nothing to say, I heard this amazing quote in the book, Take the Stairs, or I saw Rory Vaden speak on stage and he says something that was an absolute truth. Rent is due every single day, you know, whatever the full quote is, right? No one's going to remember that you said, like, it doesn't cost you anything to sound on stage. I mean, I've yeah. had people come to me and say like, did you have to name drop 35 people? And I'm like, well, that was their quote. <laughs> That right. was their citing, that the so, citing the sore. You're just citing yeah, the and source. I am. I'm standing on the shoulders of so many amazing people that helped me get to where I am. I'm not going to dishonor, you know, um, Harvey Dorfman, someone who was so critical to my success, when it was his idea that I was just sharing up there, mm-hmm. even though he's passed away. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this and has Rory, been eye opening. I mean, I get it. Like, I mean, is... it pains you. It pains you. And this is my problem with people who don't understand this space. People think that just because it's words or it's a picture that anyone else can go and do it. No. If you walked into a sports store and you took a pair of soccer cleats off the shelf and tried to walk out with it, it's it's not shocking that you would get dinged for that. Well, you can't walk into my intellectual property storehouse and take my thing off the shelf and go pass it off as your own. It's just not going to happen. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, this is eye opening, man. I mean, I got my, my Ted talk, uh, which is probably the most organically viral thing that we've ever had is few, few million views. Yeah. It's all based around a diagram that I created called the focus funnel. And my guess is Focus Funnel is probably trademarked by someone, but that visual is, if you Google it, it's everywhere. And, you know, it's like all over the place. It's because millions of people have seen that, seen that talk, but we don't have a trademark on it. Mm -hmm. And I've always, I've always kind of been like, well, the, the whole goal is to have people share it and have it impact people and all that stuff. But, you know, this is a totally challenging interview for me, like an eye opening. Because to go, man, if it's worth 250,000, I mean, we have hundreds of these visuals inside of our curriculum. Like, mm-hmm. I bet, I bet we, I, I bet we legitimately have, I mean, we probably legitimately have 35 or 40 very distinct yeah. visuals. Cause we have, we have 14 courses and each course easily has three to four. Yeah. And, and so it's like, we, but well, I was going to say, I was going to say like, so the number that I've typically found in a business that's more mature like yours. Um, and that's, there's no secret as to why I say I've got 44 registered trademarks in our right. name right now is because the average really well-designed program has about 40. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, that's, that's probably, yeah. I mean, that's, that's probably about right. So it's not hundreds, but it's dozens. And yeah. you say f- 40 and I go, yeah, yeah, 40. That's, that's, that sounds about right. But if you go, what's that, what's the math on that? 40, 40 times 250,000. 10 million. Better. Yeah. That's a big number. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, 10 million and, bucks. And bigger companies like private equity companies, that's what they're going to look at. They're going to, that's going to, because everyone wants to sell their customer list or their revenue or whatever. And, you know, people don't realize that you're being plugged into a larger ecosystem. And, um, yeah, it's, it's funny because we're talking about this topic. It's not something I typically ever get interviewed on. Yeah. That's why I wanted to ask you about this. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, but this is why, I mean, I love coaches. I go to bat for a lot of coaches. I mean, I've got my, um, you know, I've had a lot of friends come to me who are, you know, being pushed around by some people around IP and yeah, I've just, I've had a playbook for such a long time and you know, there are some big, there are some big names um, that have gotten the sharp end of our stick um, because of IP infringement. Some extremely big names in the leadership personal development space that every single person on your podcast would would know. Yeah. yeah. Well, that is, yeah, that I'll say that that has shaken me more than a couple times where I'm going. This person is basically telling a real like almost verbatim from something that I posted three mm-hmm. months ago, three months mm-hmm. ago. And I'm like, uh, it's hard to go. 
Yeah. You know, is it the same? But it's like, it's so close that you're like, I think anybody would raise an eyebrow at, at this. Yeah. Um, and it's, uh, uh, anyways, that's, here's, that's here's, here's the reality. The public doesn't care. Yeah. The public doesn't care. Yeah. The public doesn't care. And so that's because I've had friends and me like, man, because they think I'm spending so much time doing something. I'm like, I don't spend any time doing this. This is that's the purpose of having systems and processes in your business. And there's a team of like when it when when there's an inquiry that comes in from a former client or a client, and they say, "Hey, I think this person, my executive assistant, passes that straight along to the legal side, and then they just take care of it." I might become aware of it, mm -hmm. but wow. um, but yeah, like it's it's funny because it is the frustrating part. I wish people did care more about the source of where the material came from. But now in the, you know, what, 400 terabytes of contents uploaded every, you know, hour into the yeah. internet, you know, yeah. it's, it, it's hard to keep up with that, but yeah. Interesting. Well, uh, buddy, this has been amazing. I know that you, and you're doing a lot of work with entrepreneurs and things now, and we didn't, we, I mean, we went way over time, but like, where, where should people go if they want to plug into what you got going on? Uh, so toddherman.me is my kind of home base on the internet. And that has links going out to all the different other, you know, whether it's my book, the alter ego fact and, and whatnot there or entrepreneurial stuff. But uh, I know you got a big coaching audience too, and I'm scaling up a, a coaching platform to help coaches grow and serve their, their people. Because what people don't under the hardest part about this business isn't necessarily the marketing side. It's actually the delivery side because our model is all about if you're a coach, you're you're actually getting paid to help someone transform in whatever way, whether it's building a new skill, you know, reaching a new outcome, finishing a project, um, or even you know deeper emotional transformations that might be happening. And the thing that actually grows this business is actually client success. It is not marketing like everyone mm -hmm. thinks it is. It is client success because that activates referrals, retention, and testimonials. And so we're building out a platform and we, we, we built it out. We've got some, we got thousands of uh, people onto the platform. Tony Robbins company came onto it as well. And uh, yeah, so that's what I'm excited about right now. And that's upcoach.com. That's cool. So upcoach, and it's, it's basically like a, a tool for helping coaches manage all their clients and like track like the progress and, all and their clients stuff. can log in. You can put courses in there. You can track their habits. You can add tasks to them or manage projects. Like there's, you can put all your worksheets right inside of it so that you've got visibility into them, actually, whatever they're writing, instead of it being a Google doc or a PDF download as well. Really cool. Yeah. Really cool. All right, well, we'll drop you. A, we'll drop you a backlink. We'll drop you an SEO backlink to Boom. that as well, as well. You will have the full authority <laughs> of brandbuildersgroup.com uh, backlinking. So, Todd, man, this is great. I've I just I, I I've always just I learned so much from talking with you. And it's always just such a sharp perspective and um, just really helpful, man. So I appreciate you going off script here and like sharing yeah. with us like. Uh, this is definitely an interview like no other that we've ever had on the show. And um, that's well, know, good. We know. zagged, we zagged today. Um, so that's cool with me. Yeah. I love it, man. So uh, everyone make sure that you go follow Todd, send him some comments, send him some love and uh, brother. We just, we're, we're grateful for you and we, and we wish you the best. Cheers, man. This has been great.